So if you recall, we left off last time talking about some of the uh, middleware infrastructure and some of the components in Android, and I talked about a little bit about activities and services and broadcast receivers and content providers very briefly. We'll cover those in more detail later. What I wanted to do to finish off the middleware infrastructure is just to give a quick overview of how threads are implemented in Android. And a lot of the examples we'll look at later. And again, if you take the course next semester, we'll use a bunch of threading that works on Android. So it's worth understanding how it all works. So you know, what is a thread? We've talked about this before. We'll, we'll go into this in more detail with more discussion later so you get a better sense of what a thread is. Um, it's interesting because of the fact that we were using the Java 8 parallel mechanisms and completable futures, you really didn't have to know much about threads to get to where we are in the course so far, which is kind of funny because back in the day in a, in a more traditional course, we would have spent a lot of time up front about threads and thread resources and thread scheduling and all this good stuff. And, and now that Java 8's around, you don't really have to know a lot of that if you choose not to. But under the hood, of course, there's still threads. And you'll undoubtedly run across programs that do use threads. So a thread is basically the smallest unit of execution for sequences of programmed instructions. So it's basically how you get stuff to run in, in a process. So this is kind of a big picture view. So first of all, that kind of begs the question, what's a process? Anybody here take the operating systems course yet? So what, what's a process? Hopefully you guys covered that. Right, so all those things you said are correct. What, what else, what is a process? Right, a process is a running instance of a program. Caleb? Perfect, you guys nailed it. So the way to think about a process is a process is a, a unit of resource allocation and protection which is kind of what you were just saying, right? So it's got some resources that it shares, like, like its memory, for example. Um, and it's also the resource, it's also the unit of protection, which you also alluded to. So um, if you have multiple processes, which as Bruce said, have process IDs, then each of these things are distinct. And as, as Andrew said, they're programs in execution, right? They're ways to run a program. It provides the execution resources and protection resources and isolation resources and so on. For a, for a program or, or programs. And so as you can see here, these are kind of like, you know, walled off from each other in a sense. And the resources in one process are not easily accessible to the resources in another. They're, they're ways of sharing certain things and there's ways of communicating, but, but by default, they're walled off. So that of course begs the question, how do things actually run in a process? And the way things run in the process is they run in threads. And as you guys also mentioned, a process can have more than one thread. Now, by default, when a process starts, when a Unix or Linux process starts, by default, it has one thread. Um, though you can arrange to spawn other threads, either by the application or by the infrastructure. So in steady state, a process could actually have multiple threads. And in fact, in Android, they will most un undoubtedly have multiple threads. Um, and so those threads have their own resources. And we'll talk more about that later, but the key thing that a, a thread has is a stack to keep track of the method calls that it's dealing with. There are other resources it has as well. But the, the resources in a process, the thread resources in a process, share certain things like memory. So you can have multiple threads and they will share the memory within the process. And that's both a blessing and a curse, right? It's a blessing because it makes it easy for the threads, easy, relatively easy, and relatively inexpensive for threads to communicate with each other through shared objects, in other words, things that are in the memory of the process. It's easy at one level, you know, it's, it's possible to do it, but lots of headaches arise if you're not careful how you do it, because you can end up corrupting those resources and those objects through race conditions and visibility issues and all kinds of other fun stuff, which are called hazards. All right, each thread has a stack to keep track of the method state and other resources. Um, and Android implements Java threads using mechanisms in, in several different layers in, in Android. And we'll talk a bit more about layering 
shortly, probably later today, but maybe next time. And you can see that all the stuff you see here in the little red box, or not all of it, but some of the stuff in the red box is responsible for managing the layering of, of uh, thread implementations in Android. And if you really sit down and start poking around and looking at the calls that are being made, if you go to the source code, which you have access to, and you trace it, you will quickly see that there's a lot of things that happen when you start a thread. So if you say, you know, you have a thread, my thread, you say my thread dot start, that will end up calling thread dot start, which will end up calling VM thread dot create, which on some versions of Android will call Dalvik Java Lang VM thread create, which in some versions of Android will call DVM, Dalvik Virtual Machine, create interp thread, which will then call the underlying C libraries pthread create, which then calls interp thread start. Now we're back into uh, Android land again. This is, this is Android Linux land. This is Dalvik VM land, interp thread start. DVM call method, which is still in the interpreter. And then finally, our run method gets called back, right? So there's a lot of layers of calls going on here, some at your level, some in different layers of middleware and middleware infrastructure, some inside library calls, some inside the operating system kernel, a lot of overhead. So the point here is that starting a thread, which looks so easy, you say thread.start, right? What could be simpler than that? A lot of things take place when the wheels start to turn. So the point of that is don't create threads just on a whim. Create them if what you're going to do is going to block or run for a long time or you need it to run in multiple cores. And of course, the best thing to do is probably use the, the fork join pool stuff we talked about because that's optimized to do all this behind the scenes so you don't have to know or care about it. Obviously, a thread has to be given code to run. We've, we've talked about this briefly. Here's just a recap. So the way it works is there's a method called run, and you have to implement that method somehow. And there's a couple different ways to do it. One way is to have a class that implements runnable and defines the run method. And then you make an instance of the runnable and pass that as a constructor to thread when you make a new thread object that you're about to start. So this is a named class as a runnable. So that's one way to do it. Um, that's the hook method that's called back at runtime. This is rather crufty, so there's other ways of doing this stuff. Another way to do it is to make a runnable that's an anonymous runnable. So this is a little bit less crufty, although still somewhat crufty because you have all this other code you have to fill in. Um, and once again, this is the hook method that's called back at runtime. <clears throat> you can also uh, use a lambda expression, which is much lighter weight, as we've discovered over the course of the semester. And in this case, you just give the code you want to have run, and you made the, make the little lambda syntax. And this says, this takes no parameters, so it's a runnable. And uh, you just give it a piece of code, and it goes ahead and executes it. So that's clearly the most concise and economical way of doing things. Of course, what's an even more economical way of getting a thread to run? It's even more economical than using lambdas. That's, yes, but even more economical than that. Well, the best way to get a thread to run is to use something like the fork join pool or completable futures or parallel streams where all these threads take place magically under the hood and you don't know and don't care and there's no, there's no thread code at all. So, the best thread code is no thread code, often. Not always, but often. Um, all right. There are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of classes in Android and in Java that relate to Java threading one way or another, right? So you've got all kinds of crazy stuff. You've got runnable. You've got uh, thread, which is probably lurking here somewhere in this big mess. I don't even see it, but it's... That's another thing, you get runnable, you've got runnable future, future, future task, callable, thread pool executor, you know, you name it, there's a lot of stuff that's going on here. And uh, a lot of this actually now has been overtaken by events because we're, you, we have Java 8 and it hides a lot of that stuff for you. By the way, it's, it's really quite interesting. Um, a lot of people are still confused about what Java 8 provides for you. And some people think, you know, oh gosh, this functional programming stuff, it's, it's antithetical to object-oriented design, and therefore the streams framework can't be used in a normal Java application. It's only meant for special purpose 
data pipelining applications and therefore is not usable in practice. And I think that's understandable at some level because people often like to view these paradigms as mutually exclusive, right? There's object orientation and there's functional programming and they're like, you know, snake and mongoose or, uh, you know, Republican and Democrat or whatever. They can't live together harmoniously. Um, but in fact, of course, they work very nicely together. And the whole semester to this point has been showing how, you know, if you go and look at the little skeletons we give out for every assignment and all, most, many of the assignments, you'll see how we have nice object-oriented designs with classes and subclasses and superclasses and methods and encapsulation and all that other good stuff you come to know and love for object-oriented programming. And then whenever we need to do some computations, especially computations that are gonna run in parallel, we just define a little hook method like, you know, process stream or whatever. And that's where we put our code that's the functional code. So it's nestled nicely within this architecture of objects and structured using good object-oriented design. But when we need to do things that run in parallel, we just write the code that does that. And it turns out, hopefully you've seen by this point, that using these higher level abstractions just means a lot less work. Now, you know, we could have programmed all of the stuff that we've programmed using this morass of other classes, which are sort of more classically object-oriented. But why the heck would we want to do that, right? It doesn't really give us any win from a performance point of view. It's a heck of a lot more work. And the only reason you can really possibly want to program with this stuff is if you're working in an environment that has the misfortune of not being able to use newer versions of Java. Right, so if you're stuck, you know, if you're shipwrecked in an island in the Pacific and all you have is a Java virtual machine circa 2004, then you'll have to stick with these things. But if you're in any modern world, you'll, you'll use the newer stuff. Android also encapsulates a lot of this stuff. So, so Java 8 encapsulated a lot of stuff. And then Android also has its own encapsulations. And we'll talk a little bit about some of these things. The, the two main things it has are something called the the uh, Hammer Framework, which stands for Handlers, Messages, and Runnables, Hammer, Hammer Framework, and the Async Task Framework. And we'll hopefully have time to talk about both of those a little bit more because they're quite interesting. Um, and they're very orthogonal to Java 8 stuff. This is more kind of classic object orientation type frameworks. But they're specially designed for some of the quirks of Android and the way that Android runs and the way that Android has a user interface thread where the interactions with the user takes place, but you can't block. So you've got to do longer running stuff and other threads. And the whole framework is sort of organized to help decouple the UI thread from other processing that takes place in the background. And you can watch other videos or come back next semester and we'll go through this in much more detail. Okay. Any questions about that? <clears throat> 